All right, so very quickly we'll talk about what an icon is. Unfortunately, I don't have a screen in front of me, so I'll just turn a little bit. Um, it's, it's some of the things Sayedna said. The word icon is Greek for image. Um, and, and to follow up on what Sayedna said, it's not, a whole, it's not necessarily a holy picture, but an icon is supposed to depict um, theology. It's supposed to depict teaching. It's supposed to de depict worship. Um, so it's not about um, a picture or necessarily just something superficial, but rather something much deeper. And we'll get into that uh, as we go along. Uh, I was asked to just talk about different icons, so I'm just going to talk about different ones, ones you may have seen in the past, and just kind of explain what they mean, and then you can just try to remember them when the screen flashes away, and then when it comes back, oh, there it is, okay. So this is actually one of the earliest icons, probably the oldest icon of Christ. It's in uh, the Monastery of St. Catherine in, the si in Sinai. Um, and the iconographer that drew this one actually, if you look, the face is kind of weird. Half the face looks one way and half the face looks another way. So what they did is they took an image and they just kind of, with Photoshop, cut the image in the middle. And if you cut the image in the middle and you replicate it on both sides, this is actually what the iconographer was drawing, right? So half of his face, if you split the other half and, and, and flip it, it looks like that. And the other half looks like that, right? So if you put all three together uh, on the total left, um, on the total left, you see uh, the original and then you see what the iconographer is trying to do, and different interpretations of this exist, but one of them is half the, the, the one in the middle is his humanity, and the one on the right is his divinity, and so the iconographer was trying to show his humanity and his divinity, so he drew half his face as human and half, his, half, half of his face as divine. And then if you just take Photoshop and you split it down the middle and you flip it, you can see that it looks uh, the way it looks. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. Um, so I'll go to the second bullet. The icon depicts its subject, and Satan was talking about this, at the same time being human and yet full of God. So what the icon is trying to do is trying to show you God coming through the martyr or coming through the saint, right? Um, and so what we're trying to do is create an art that doesn't show the humanity of the person as much as it shows how God is working in that person. So the idea of the physical attributes of the art the, the physical attributes is obviously how the, the saint looked on the outside, but what the artist is, the iconographer is really trying to do is trying to show God coming through the face and the, the body of the saint. Right? So it's trying to craft an art that isn't really human per se, it's more spiritual in nature, and we'll talk a lot about that. Um, so uh, you want to see them, um, so in the, 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 the icon then depress, uh, expresses a deeper realism then would be shown. So if you want to say, like, how come our icons aren't realistic? Uh, it's actually the opposite, right? The icons are more realistic, right? Because we care less about the way a saint looked or the way his face looks or his anatomical features. We care much more about the reality of the saint's spiritual life and the spirituality of the saint and the spirituality of the Theotokos and of Christ. And so our art is actually more realistic. Right? Because the, the reality is this is a holy man of God. Um, so everything in the church tailors to both the physical and the spiritual. Right? Uh, we have icons uh, for sight. We have incense for smell. We have singing for hearing. Right? All of these things, the, the, the church doesn't uh, ignore the physical aspect of, of the human being. And that's why we have art uh, and iconography in the church, because we can't just kind of imagine all of these things. And, we call these icons, the very first slide, is a window into heaven, right? A window into eternity. And it's kind of a nice image for me that you have a blank, you know, a white wall, and then you put an icon on it, and it's almost like this, this window into the, the reality, right? The window into heaven, the window into what's actually in the church, right? So these icons become more of a reality than the physical. And it's not a physical art, and it's not meant to be anatomically correct. So the idea of the icon isn't to look the way a human being looks physically, right? But it is it's meant to depict the way the saint is spiritually, right? So, and we'll see examples of that. Uh, it's not supposed to show them accurately how they looked per se. Um, and it's not meant to show physical attributes such as muscles or beauty or, or the kind of the... the, the the, the physical characteristics, but the spiritual. I remember when we hung this icon uh, 
up here. Uh, it was the first icon hung. I still remember when it, when it got hung. Uh, one of the, the comments that someone made about this icon was they all look the same, right? All the apostles look the same. And they're like, can't I, Isaac Venus, we spent all this money, can't he make faces look different? And the whole idea is they're supposed to look like Christ, right? They're all in the image of Christ. So that was the, the purpose of the icon. And yet people were criticizing that he doesn't know how to draw faces and why we paid this guy to come here. So this is a picture of St. George, for example. As you can see, he's, got, he's really buff. He's got a lot of muscles, right? He's flexing his arm. You know, his legs are well-developed. He's wearing short shorts, right? And, and what, is this, what is this artist trying to do? Who is he trying to show, right? There's this picture, I saw it in, uh, I won't say where I saw it, of Archangel Michael. And, you know, he's, he's just a bodybuilder and his hairline comes down to here and it flows back. Not that I'm bitter, that I don't have hair, but you know, he's got long hair and he's wearing these short shorts and he's just as buff as they come. And you're thinking, what are you trying to do? What is the artist trying to do? What is he trying to show? What's he impressed with? You know, what, what's the iconographer's personal view of spiritual life that he would draw such a picture of Archangel Michael, right? And so we'll talk a little bit about this as well. So um, we don't show St. Mary, for example, as beautiful right, as, as pretty. Um, in fact, the history of, the, of, of art, of Renaissance, tells us that many of the very famous pictures of St. Mary were actually modeled after the artist's girlfriend, right? And so he'll, he'll show his, paint his girlfriend, sometimes, you know, scantily clad, not wearing a lot of clothing, kind of, you know, voluptuous and, and sheer clothing, and then just write, you know, St. Mary, the mother of God at the bottom and sell it to a church, right? And the girlfriend, of course, is really happy, right? And she's very beautiful, and so, the church is trying to say St. Mary is far more than pretty, right? That's, that's only part of the reality, right? The reality of her beauty comes from her patience and her meekness and her long-suffering and the wisdom that she had. That's who she actually is. That's the reality of the Theotokos, right? So I want to now have an art that shows that reality, the real reality, not the way someone looks because you all know that you know, the way you look changes right after a few years and then after you pass away and after you have plastic surgery, right? It, it all can change. So none of that really is the reality of the person. So a few um, points. Uh, we never show pain or agony in an icon, even in martyrdom. So I know half of you can't see this, but the icon of St. Stephen, for example, here he's being stoned. And as he's being stoned, he looks up to heaven and he's very peaceful. And I remember hearing this as a kid um, and thinking, you know, it's kind of an interesting way to depict martyrdom until I saw the video of the 21 martyrs. And then I got it. I got why we depict martyrs like that. And I got why the Sinixar talks about martyrdom like that. Because I watched them and they looked just like that icon, right? And I'll show you some pictures here in a little bit where the, you know, the, the, the Christ is, you know, contorted and he's in pain and he's in agony and there's misery. And you think, no, that's, that's not the way it was. That's not the way the martyrdom was. That's not the way the cynics are records or history records for us that the way the martyrdom happened. Uh, mouths are smaller because tongues are dangerous. Eyes are larger than normal uh, because the goal of life is illumination and eyes are the windows of the soul. Um, they're always peaceful. Sometimes their ears are enlarged because enlarged saints hear the prayers. Um, we shouldn't really be able to recognize their face all that much. They should have the image of Christ. This becomes challenging when you have someone like Pope Carillos or Emba Brum, who we actually know what they look like. So now we have this challenge in the, in the new era where we're trying to mix real pictures and keep the image of Christ in them. So iconographers are, are being challenged. Um, and icons have transfigured faces, like I said before. All of them look like Christ because they're all in the image and likeness of Christ. So when you look at this icon of St. Anthony, um, this was an icon that uh, Buna AP has. If you look at the face, now, what happened? Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's actually not this one. This one is better. <laughs> when, when, you, when you look at that, the face, in my opinion, um, when you look at the face of St. Anthony up close, the eyes are just stunning, right? A man of prayer, a man of wisdom, right? This iconographer is showing the virtue of who St. Anthony is, right? If there could be one picture 
and, and try to capture this man's face. We all know the very famous story of people that would sit and talk with him and this one person who was quiet and St. Anthony said, why are you quiet? And he said, it's enough for me to look at your face, my father, and that gives me peace, right? And, and that face depicts that, right? There's a spirituality, there's a tenderness, there's a wisdom in that face. It doesn't matter that he really looked like that or not, right? And then I compare it to a picture like that. Okay, someone sent that to me the other day. What, what is that? Right? I mean, the, I, <laughs> I mean the, he's an angel, apparently. Um, what, what, is, what is this artist trying to say? What is this artist trying to do? What matters to this artist? Is there any spirituality here? I mean, uh, you look at something like that and you're like, what is that? Right? Where is this person's head? What's he thinking about that he would draw something like that and call that an angel? Right? Anyway, let's get it off. Okay. So um, we'll talk quickly about the icon of the Theotokos. It's always, icons are always have gold in the background, and the gold is always a reminder that they're in heaven. It's a heavenly color, right? And there's actually more explanation to it, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass for now. But that they're in a state of glorification. The halo, and this is an important little point, the halo is an expression of holiness. And so you see that the halo, the, the saint emits holiness that kind of comes out, and that holiness comes from the saint as a unification of, of God and man, right? As, as Christ enlightens him and transforms him and transfigures him or her. And so you see the halo kind of uh, moving out. And this is uh, in, in contrast to the, the Augustinian or the Blessed Augustine or the St. Augustinian view, of uh, which 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 kind of says that men is men are nothing and that God's grace is everything, right? So if you look at some of these other halos, they look like this dish that kind of came down from heaven, and this dish actually represents a little bit of the theology of of John Calvin and some of these others. It says that man really is nothing and that God's grace is everything. Right? And, and so if someone is holy, it is only because they're, they're holy, only because God's grace descended and kind of picked them at some level, right? This idea of predestination, even in, in some of John Calvin's work. Whereas the icon isn't, doesn't say that. It says that man and God unite and that the, the saint himself emits holiness, right? Even to the point after the saint passes his body, his relics or her relics emit holiness, right? So there's a transformation. Uh, you notice that Christ always has a cross in his halo. So even in every icon, you'll see that there's a cross. And that's how you can always pick out Christ in every icon. There's always a cross in his halo. Um, St. Mary has three stars depicting her perpetual virginity before, during, and after the incarnation. Um, and what does St. Mary appear to be doing in this icon? So take a good look at this icon. What's the story this iconographer is telling? He's kind of presenting, she's presenting him, right? And she's presenting him as the savior of the world, right? And if you look at some of these icons, it's the same story, right? She's presenting him as his divinity. This is, this is God who came to earth to save mankind, right? And if you compare that to this one, how's this one different? What story is this one telling? A mother, right? Now this one is telling more the story of his humanity. Right? And you can see more of that same style, right? It's a very different, you know, and these other ones, Christ is looking away from her. He's looking at the cross. He's looking at his mission on earth. And these, this is a very tender mother to son relationship, right? So in these icons, the iconographer wants to tell a completely different story, right? And it's not like one's right and one's wrong, okay? They're just, it's, it's like a, an author of a book who wants to tell a different aspect about something about Christ. And he can choose you know, one can talk about humanity and one can talk about divinity, and that's okay. Um, we always have, uh, in, in, the, in the Coptic tradition, uh, Christ, uh, the, the queen is always to the right of, of Christ, so she's always on his right. And this is an icon from the Coptic Museum that I took with my phone illegally. Um, <laughs> I was supposed to pay 20 guinea and I didn't do it. So, but um, anyway, so this is a really beautiful one. And, and you all remember in the, in the ninth hour of the Igbeya, uh, behold, my bowels are ablaze when I behold your crucifixion, right? And this is, this again brings about this, this, uh, this way, the tenderness 
between the, the relationship between Christ and Mary, right? And I think this is something we don't always think about as much. And here you have these iconographers trying to bring this out a little bit, right? When Christ was crucified, right, that what she must have felt, right? And this, this kind of comes back to the theology of why we venerate St. Mary. Right? We're all called to die with Christ. We're all called to sacrifice and to, um, to, to carry our cross with Christ. And you can imagine when Christ, during Holy Week, carried his cross, how St. Mary felt. Right? I mean, we, we sit in Holy Week and we kind of, you know, we, we kind of try to feel what, try to participate with that, with Christ. But you can imagine how much St. Mary participated in reality with Christ during this time. So here the iconographer is trying to show this, this idea of, you know, this relationship between them, right? And, and every once in a while you watch these movies, Son of God or, or The Passion, and, and they bring a, these pieces, right, where Christ comes back to the town and he goes and visits his mom, right? And something we don't really think about, that relationship. Okay. Um, this is the icon of the Transfiguration. This is Stefan René's. This is one of my favorite icons ever. Um, but I want to point out something really unique in some of these icons. If you look, and you can see this in all the icons if you look carefully, um, his light actually comes through. So one of the unique features of iconography is every place, if you were to lift your arms, every place your skin would touch your clothing, it's light, right? So his light is actually coming through his clothing. And if you walk around the icons today and look at them carefully, which I encourage you to do, um, you'll see that every place, even in the saints, every place they touch, their skin where it would bind on their, on their bodies. Light is actually emitting through the icon. Um, so I wanted to go through just a couple of different icons and, and, uh, until I run out of time. Um, this is the Ladder of Divine Ascent. This is the Byzantine version. And you can see it's kind of harsh. <laughs> um, you got devils pulling people off the ladder and it's, you know, um, mean. <laughs> Some of them are meaner. This is a less mean one. Um, and so I found this, uh, this Coptic one uh, I think that Fedi did, um, and it's the Ladder of Divine Ascent. It's a little bit more uplifting, but it's all monks. Uh, and so when I was in Egypt, I asked an iconographer to make an icon like this one, and him and I kind of had a back and forth, um, and we discussed you know, whether or not they should all be monks. And I said, no, they shouldn't all be monks. Maybe some of them should be regular people. So we ended up making this one, uh, and this one's in my house. It's really nice. <laughs> but um, you, you'll see that... Um, the angels, the saints are waiting for everybody up above. And then the people are dressed in regular clothing. Um, so this is sort of an adaptation, if you will. Um, and as they get up and higher up the ladder, they get younger, right? So who's in the arms of Christ? It's the child. The youngest one is in the arms of Christ. So even that little bit, the iconographer wanted to put some meaning in this particular icon and say the youngest person is in the arms of Christ and they sort of get older, or if you want to go the other way, they start old and they get younger. As they get younger, they get closer and closer up the ladder uh, towards Christ. Um, and Zena talked a little bit about some of this, but there's a, there's a controversy called the iconoclastic controversy. I'll discuss it very briefly. It's the 6th and 7th century, um, where basically they believed that there was, and some of these questions relate to this, that iconography was pagan worship. Um, and they started trying to destroy icons. In fact, that's why we have very, very few icons before the 7th century. Everything was destroyed, except for the ones at Deir St. Catherine, at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, because it was so far away that nobody went there <laughs> to destroy them. Um, and so those are the only icons we have. Uh, St. John of Damascus was one of the people who defended iconography, and I just want to read this quote. I do not worship matter. I worship the creator of matter, who became matter for my sake, who willed to take his abode in matter, who worked out my salvation through matter, never will I cease honoring the matter with which my salvation, which, which wrought my salvation, right? So the fact that God took a flesh, he blessed matter, right? And that's why the church bestows blessings through matter, right? Through, the, through bread, through wine, through oil, through water, right? The church constantly uses matter and the creation and has no problem. We don't think creation is evil. We don't think what God made is bad, right? And we will, the church will give blessing through matter, right? And the icon is in very much the same light. We don't worship wood and paint, right, by any stretch of the imagination. We don't kiss an icon because we think that is the saint, right? But rather we worship the prototype who is behind the saint. So uh, that's, a, that's an old 
uh, image, and you can see what the iconoclast did. They went to every face, and they took a chisel and a hammer, and they destroyed it, right? So we have a lot of examples of old art that look like this. Um, okay, I'll skip. All right, so, um, so this is the icon of the nativity. Um, and, and some little points about the nativity icon. So God becomes man. And so Christ is the center of the icon, right? Always. He's always the center of the icon, and he is the focus of it. In fact, Joseph is off to the side. And in this particular icon, he's not. He's, and in that one, he's not. But he's off to the side. He's smaller, as you can tell, than St. Mary. And in some icons, he's off in the corner of the icon, sometimes with his hand on his cheek, and he has no idea what's happening. Right? And that's, that's like this icon over here, where he's way in the left corner of the icon. He's got his hand on his cheek, and he's not part of this at all. Right? He's seeing shepherds, he's seeing angels, and he's really confused. Okay? And this uh, is very consistent with our belief that it's really about St. Mary and Christ, and that Joseph was sent there as a caretaker of St. Mary, but they are not the holy family. Right? They're not a couple. And this is in, in contrast to the Protestant belief that St. Mary and, and, and uh, Joseph later had got married and had other kids who were the brothers of Christ. Right? And so that's why we depict our icon where Joseph is kind of separate from the act of the incarnation. Right? And every once in a while you'll see a picture like this, right? where you have a young Joseph who's got his arm around Mary. Okay? And this is telling a very different story. Right? This is not this is not about the incarnation. This is about a couple, right? And they, this is their baby together, Jesus, okay? And then they have more kids together, right? And this is a very different theology than what the Orthodox Church teaches. And unfortunately, you, you'll sometimes kind of find an icon that sort of takes that flavor, right? An iconographer says, well, maybe I'll make a holy family kind of icon, right? And he's got his arm around Mary, and it just doesn't, it doesn't fit, right? It's nothing like the traditional icon of the incarnation where Christ and Mary are the center of the icon. Everything around them are prophecies about what happened that day or things from the Old Testament. And it's more about the couple or the family. And sometimes iconographers want to get in on the act because they can sell more icons that way. Uh, the iconographer characteristic. So this is a really great icon if you look at it carefully. It's an iconographer. It's an icon of an iconographer drawing an icon. Okay, and. The iconographer's eyes are closed, and the angel is gu guiding the iconographer's hands. I love this icon. It's just kind of beautiful. Okay? And so the iconographer's eyes are closed, and he's drawing, and his hands are being guided by the spirit. Okay? So the use of icons has lots of meanings. As Sayyidina mentioned, the colors all have different meanings. Um, and one of the important things is um, the iconographer should be a spiritual person. Right? Because they tell a spiritual story. It's like, you know, sometimes just getting an art degree is not enough. Right? It's like, I want to write a book on theology, but I haven't really been trained in theology or spiritual life, but I just really like to write. I'm a good writer. Okay? That doesn't make you a good spiritual book writer. Okay? You need that spiritual life. Right? And same with, with iconography. It's not enough to be, I'm really artistically inclined. I might as well go into icons. No, there's, there's a unity there between the two. And the iconographer has to have these spiritual characteristics. And that's why in the early church, many times monks and nuns are the ones who, do, who would write the icons. Um, while they write the icon, they usually fast and pray during the, the writing of the icon. They're living, they're living part of the body of Christ in orthodoxy. Um, they draw from the heart. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll retell, the, they'll read the story before they write the icon. Um, and the icons are generated to their own spiritual knowledge. Um, it's a, I'll tell you the f a funny story about this icon. Um, the, icon the icon on the left, uh, the iconographer, this is the, 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 par the parable of the, the prodigal son. And the iconographer on the left, I was negotiating with him about uh, having Christ bend over. To, to, um, to hug the prodigal son. And he didn't want to. He's like, right? Christ doesn't bend over. Okay? And that struck me. I was like, of course he does. He bends for all of us. Right? If, if, he, if, he, if he bent over and washed the feet of the apostles, he's not going to bend over to, to receive me. And, and so it depicted to me his life with God. Christ to him was like, 
يعني metropolitan or a pope or some you know some you know guy right so, uh, he doesn't bend over you know and, and he had a problem with it and and it showed me like he's bent over for me you know and so his spiritual life was coming out in the iconography right and I just want to give that small example uh, of that story right where it shows it shows that how the iconographer lives his spiritual or her spiritual life affects the way the art comes out right it's not enough that they just know how to draw and copy um, the art oops so this is the Last Supper that's right here and uh, one of the uh, the nice things about the icons and, and Zayna touched on this very briefly is 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 the you in the icons so where are you in this icon Stare at it for a second. You're at the table. The table doesn't end in the icon. Right? You're at the head of the table, and you're part of the, the Last Supper, as we are every single Sunday. Right? You see this in the Byzantine tradition as well. There's a half table. You're at the table. Right? The Eucharist isn't an event that happened in history. It is an event that happened this morning. Right? The Last Supper is an event that happens and is always happening. Right? Now compare that to this picture. Where are you? You're watching. You're watching a bunch of people have a meal. Right? It's chaotic. Right? Look at the, uh, I can leave it. Look at the focus of this one where everyone is focused. Every apostle, except for Judas, every apostle is eyes on Christ. This is a chaotic scene of people talking about whatever and politics and who, who knows what they're saying. It feels chaotic, right? And there's that halo again that I talked about before, the halo that kind of like a grace-filled halo that just kind of comes and descends on your head like a dish as opposed to one that radiates holiness. This is the icon of the crucifixion. And again, as you all know, during Holy Week, we say thine is the power and the glory and the might. We say thok tigom over and over and over again. Right? And, 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 so we're, and, and I imagine if someone walked into a church, uh, a visitor during Holy Week, and saw an icon of the crucifixion here, and heard us saying, thine is the power and the glory and the might, he would think we're kind of off. Right? He would think this is kind of weird. This, this guy they worship is crucified, and they're saying power and glory and might, even though he was hung on a tree. Right? But this is our belief of the crucifixion, right? that Christ gave it up by his own free will, right? and that he died with glory and honor and power and might. Right? Um, and what we don't want to depict in the church is feeling sorry for Jesus. Right? And sometimes it's easy to emit this emotion. Right? Like when we put black up around the church, we don't put black because we feel sorry for Jesus. Right? Or that we're sad for Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, he said that to one of the women who were crying, didn't he? If she was crying, he walked by her and he said, don't cry for me. Right? Cry for you and your children. Right? So when we put up the black, we're sad for ourselves because we do this. Right? So certainly the art does not depict Christ, poor Jesus, poor guy. Right? Whereas you look at this picture, and that's what it does. Right? It, it's, the artist is trying to get you to feel sorry for Jesus. Right? If you look at his fingers and, the, and even the skin that's a little off color, it's, it's, it's horrendous. Right? And the iconographer, his objective here is to, is, is to make you feel bad for this guy who's crucified. Maybe make you feel bad about yourself. Right? But that's not the peaceful love that's in the icon. All right. So, this is the icon of the picture of. I'll, I'll stop. Whenever you guys are bored, just give me the, you know, and I'll stop. Um, this is the 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 the, the Peter crossing the, uh, walking on the water. How do you feel about this picture when you look at it? What are the emotions that come to mind? Scared. Scared. It's chaos. There's fear. There's agitation. There's water. There's waves. There's a lot of effort put into the waves and the wind and the thunder. And, and you see that corner there? And I know none of you can read it, so I'll zoom it up for you. He says, I was commissioned to paint another version of a painting that is hung at the church. I decided to flip the composition and show Peter walking on water to Jesus since he's the only man in history to do so. I hadn't seen this quote the first time I, I used this icon in the slide. I felt this quote. So let's look at the picture again. 
Who's this icon about? Who's in the middle? Peter. And, and then his quote confirmed it. I wrote this about Peter since he's the first man in history to walk on water. Who's the icon about? It's about Peter, the first man in history to walk on water. Look what man did. What kind of thinking is that? Right? Whereas you look at this icon, and it's very clear who this icon is about. It's about Christ and how he saves me and the, the look between Peter and Christ. And you can stare at that icon a really long time. And all you, all you feel is that, that guy Peter, that's me. And Christ is carrying me, right? And that love between the two. There's no chaos, there's no fear. There's, it's, it's about that relationship, right? So again, Christ is always the focus of the icon, not the, the waves and how well I can draw water and clouds and, and all this other stuff. Resurrection. Who's this icon about? Well, this one least is about Christ. You know, we're moving in the right direction. But is it really just about Him? Is the resurrection of Christ about Christ? Who's Christ's resurrection for? For me, for us. Right? And so in the orthodox icon of the resurrection, who's He pulling up? Us, Adam and Eve, right? All of humanity. Right? So Christ's resurrection isn't spectacular because it was Christ's, right? Because, I mean, at some level, right, if, 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 I mean, Christ rose several people from the dead, he did tons and tons of miracles, at some level, if he hadn't risen from the dead, I'd kind of be surprised, right? It shouldn't shock me if I believe the rest of the Gospels that he then rose from the dead. What's really amazing is he rose me with him. Right? In fact, if his whole purpose was to rise from the dead just to prove that he was Christ, it actually wasn't very effective, right? Because still, you know, the Jews didn't believe him and many other people didn't believe him, right? So the resurrection of Christ is my resurrection, right? And so again, just like the Eucharist isn't about that event in the past and how magnificent it was, but rather it's about my Eucharist and my partaking of the body and blood. This is about my resurrection. So Christ is raising us with him. Skip. This is an icon of St. Paul that we uh, had commissioned. I'll, am I over on time? You can just, what time is it? I've been like five more minutes, okay. Uh, this is an icon of St. Paul that we had uh, made for St. Paul's church. And it, it's got the life of St. Paul in a, in a circle. The first one in the middle is um, on the road to Damascus. And then as you go around the circle, uh, you see that the, the different events of his life um, kind of put all together in one. Uh, this was kind of fun because all of these different icons, uh, Zach Fenus had made at some point, um, and so we found them, and then we put them all into one icon. Oops. And there's the uh, iconographer. Her name is uh, Nancy. Uh, that's in Egypt. This is an icon uh, we had made that's also hanging in our house. Um, and this one is uh, Christ, and all of the saints who defended the faith, not all of them, but many of the saints who defended the faith around him. Um, and once again, the iconographer and I kind of had a back and forth where we discussed, you know, what's the point of this icon? And so we decided uh, that we don't, we're not just going to put random saints up, but rather the defenders of the faith. And so we picked our favorites um, and, and put them up there. Okay. All right, so this is a very nice qu uh, quote. The very heart of the church liturgical art is the restoration to creation of the beauty, perfection, and goodness which is natural to God. So again, the icon is trying to bring about this restoration. As, as, as Satan has said, St. Ethos talks about how uh, corruption enters the world, right? And, and man is recreated, uh, as St. Ethanus just talks about. And that's what the icon is trying to, to depict. Within this theological perspective, beauty is not and cannot be subjective. Rather, beauty is objective truth itself. Through liturgical art, man can personally participate in the church's experience of God. So. Uh, iconography is not iconography is not just an art it's a sacred art it's a very important art in the church um, and as Satan said during the 17th and 18th centuries in Egypt when they were building a lot of churches because they got this period where they're allowed to build a lot of churches they just started bringing Western uh, artists to fill the churches because they didn't have enough iconographers uh, and thank God is Ekfenus kind of rev revitalized and, and revived uh, this neoclassical uh, Coptic movement uh, something that we hope uh, continues and then this is the last picture I have. This is when Satan came to visit us 
uh, in Egypt. Uh, we were living there for a little bit, and that's an icon of St. Monica, and that uh, is at St. Monica Church uh, now. Uh, and that's all I have. Um, do I have time for questions, or should I just stop? Okay. <laughs> I'm not even going to think about answering that question. Um, oh, is it wrong to sign icons? Most of our icons are signed. Okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, it, it's better that the iconographer not sign the icon because uh, a signature on a piece of art means I made this, right? And as that icon of the iconographer shows that it isn't the iconographer that made it, but hopefully the iconographer's hand that made it, right? So sometimes uh, iconographers will sign on the back. I've seen a lot of iconographers sign on the back. Or the right by the hand of such and such, right? So it wasn't me that made the icon, but my hand as a tool of God that made the icon. So that's uh, a better thing. Unfortunately, now everybody signs uh, their icons because business is tough. Okay. Uh, would we accept the Seventh Council iconoclasm had we been part of it? Uh. Um, the, 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 the teachings of the, so we, so the, the, just iconoclasm happened in the seventh century, as you all know, seventh, eighth century, as you all know, uh, Islam had entered Egypt by that point, and, and the Muslims were against icons anyway, so we were having our own little iconoclastic, iconoclastic controversy in our own hometown, but we didn't participate in the iconoclastic, uh, we weren't part of that uh, problem. Um, but having said that, you know, whenever uh, a heresy enters the church, Right? It, it, it's, it's good in, in, in that it forces you to define um, what we really believe. Right? So some of the quotes from uh, St. Theodore and St. John of Damascus that I put up earlier, those came out of that iconoclastic movement. Right? And they, they, Some great theologians thought long and hard about why we have iconography and what is the point of iconography. And it forced us to kind of really evaluate it. So I would say that we really agree with the major tenets of that council, right, and everything that kind of came out of it, because it's, it's, it's the theology of the church. In fact, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, I'm pretty sure that um, the feast of this is called the triumph of orthodoxy, right? The feast of this, of, of, of this uh, defeating the iconoclastic movement is called the triumph of orthodoxy. So to them, uh, certainly this iconography and the orthodoxy are very inter intertwined, right? The theology were, were very intertwined. I don't know if that made any sense. There is one more thing I want to say about the light. If you notice, Satan talked a lot about light, and it's, it was a really good point. Christ is always the source of light in every icon. So you can see even in this icon that it, as, he, as you move away from Christ, it gets darker and darker, so it's light right around him. And even if you look at maybe, uh, if you, even if you look at the necks of the apostles, like look at the neck of this apostle, it's, and their face is lit more on this side, and their neck is lit more on this side, whereas these apostles, their face is lit more on this side and their necks, it's kind of hard to see on this one. Oh, John the Baptist is easier. Um, if you look at John the Baptist, his face and his neck is lit on this side. Look at this angel, his face and his neck are lit on this side, whereas this angel, his face and his neck are lit on that side. So Christ becomes the source of light in every, every icon, as he is the light of the world. And as Satan mentioned, he's the largest uh, in all of the icons because all of the icons are about Christ and not about the event themselves. Glory be to God forever. Amen.